Hello, I'm Carl Gutowski and I'll be commenting on the article by Lou and others on epidural anesthesia combined with general anesthesia versus general anesthesia alone in patients undergoing free flap breast reconstruction. Let's start with why this is important. For most of us, the choice of anesthesia is determined by the anesthesiologist. As long as the patient's not moving, we're happy. However, general anesthesia alone requires more narcotic use and has more associated postoperative nausea and vomiting, both of which prolong recovery and can contribute to complications. Recent observations suggest that patients who experience excessive pain in the early postoperative period are more likely to develop chronic pain. Therefore, blocking surgical pain, even while already using general anesthesia, may have benefits postoperatively. Furthermore, severe pain may be associated with vasoconstriction, which can compromise flap reconstruction. So let's explore this further. This is a retrospective, non-randomized comparison of 53 deep inferior epigastric perforator flap breast reconstructions with epidural and general anesthesia, compared with 46 similar patients with general anesthesia alone. In the combined group, the epidural anesthesia was discontinued at the end of surgery. After analysis, the combined epidural and general anesthesia cohort had less postoperative nausea and vomiting and lower pain scores. Intraoperative opioid use is a risk factor for postoperative nausea and vomiting. The average narcotic dose administered in the epidural and general anesthesia group was considerably lower than in the general anesthesia alone group. Another benefit of epidural anesthesia is that it can decrease vasospasm, which may improve microvascular reconstruction outcomes. One concern of epidural anesthesia is hypotension. The mean arterial pressures were lower in the combined epidural and general anesthesia patients, but there was no increase in flap thrombosis or failure. Vasopressor use to maintain mean arterial pressure was similar between the groups. In my own personal experience with epidural anesthesia in tram breast reconstruction patients, more intravenous fluids are needed to maintain mean arterial pressure. There are, of course, other risks of epidural anesthesia, including epidural hematoma, epidural abscess, unintentional dural puncture, and spinal cord injury. And these must be weighed against the lower rates of postoperative nausea and vomiting and less narcotic use, both of which lead to a more rapid recovery. In this study, the epidural was removed at the end of surgery due to concerns of bleeding, since the patients were receiving anticoagulation for VTE prophylaxis. However, if pharmacologic prophylaxis is not being administered, then the epidural anesthesia may be continued for two to three days after surgery, which would offer even better pain control and less postoperative nausea and vomiting. As surgeons, we should engage our anesthesiologists and work as a team to provide an optimal perioperative experience. When possible, regional and neuraxial anesthesia should be considered. Perhaps the transverse abdominis plane block, or TAP block, used successfully in abdominoplasties can be another option for pain control after abdominal-based breast reconstruction. Finally, to achieve optimal postoperative pain control, we need to utilize multimodality analgesia as detailed in a recent PRS journal supplement entitled Current Concepts in Pain Management. Thanks for listening and think about sharing this article with your anesthesiologists.